Hi, everyone. This is Jackie Cooper with Crypto Mom 2 Talk Show, and I want to welcome everyone back to this episode. And as always, I want to remind you to like and subscribe. Um, today, I have a guest on who I've had many a conversation over the years with, and um, he's a trusted advisor. He um, is in the accounting area, and we're gonna I'm going to bounce over to him in a quick second. Um, the reason why we wanted to have this kind of conversation today and right now is because it's, what, August, September? So we're supposed to be thinking about maybe planning ahead for our taxes at the end of the year, kind of strategizing, that type of thing. But also, if you're in the crypto space, there's a lot to think about because it's not just about, um, again, these shows are not financial advice. They're not legal advice. You have to invest at your own risk. And they're not even, you know, accounting advice either. You know, we're going to give you an overview. They're basically education. But, you know, as you are navigating the blockchain and you're putting, you know, your funds, um, small or large, into crypto, um, you there's a lot to know, especially if um, you're in the United States and you are filing your taxes and you are then asked, do you hold crypto? Again, there's certain things that the, Um, the tax forms are starting to ask you for, and then your, um, your team needs to know, and your team includes not just your CPA, but your attorney, your family. And so from that perspective, we're going to be talking about all of the ways that you need to think about organizing your information. I know today, perfectly honestly, I was going through my wallets and um, I haven't, some of these wallets I haven't looked at since February because I've been traveling and doing other things. And that I would say, you know, don't do what I did. You need to be looking at it every month. You need to be, or every two months, you know, at the very least, so you can record what your, um, you know, vary, the various movement. But again, those are details we're going to get to into a second. So be, for those that are new to Crypto Mom 2, I just want to tell you a little bit about my background, and then we're going to actually dive deep into what we're talking about today. Um, I'm a lawyer, and I'm also a special educator, and I'm also hence a mom. But I really view the shows as a way for everyone to kind of enjoy the creativity within the blockchain space. I love interviewing people around the world, but I also um, am firmly, firmly a believer of, which is why the show is close to my heart, organizing your information, because we never know what is going to come tomorrow. So um, I will have a link down below for um, my legal side, because if you do not have a will, if you do not have an estate plan, this is the time. Don't procrastinate. Reach out, get the information you need, because if something was to happen to you and you've invested in cryptocurrency, NFTs, any of the digital assets on the blockchain, if your family doesn't know how to access it, it's in the wind. Mm -hmm. And if you don't remember, let's say you got it, heaven forbid, you get into an accident and you're in the hospital and you need to access your digital assets and you haven't organized your information so that way your family can access the wealth that you've created, small or large, then it's in the wind. So you have to think about if you're doing this, it's not just a hobby. You're, you know, you're, you're there to make a profit and um, to have fun. And that's why the other reason why the IRS is looking at all this. But that's, um, again, why I'm going to bounce over to Joshua because I want to bring him into this conversation. He is an expert in this area. And um, when I first started chatting with him, uh, I know crypto was kind of on his horizon. And now he's really done a deep dive. And he's writing a lot, uh, blogging a lot, and also doing talk shows. So welcome, Joshua. How are you doing today? Jackie, I'm doing wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure being back and, and talking crypto or even all the other things we talk about. I know we don't yeah. just talk crypto, but we talk many different topics, but it's always a pleasure to sit down with you. I feel like I'm always learning something new, whether I'm sitting down speaking with you or listening to one of your shows. So I definitely appreciate you having me back. Thank you. So um, why don't you go ahead and share with everyone um, how they can reach you. And for anyone who's driving or listening and you don't have a pen and paper, don't worry. The blog in the blog below will be the links. But for those that do have the ability to write down your contact information, because I do highly recommend that you always find someone who's on your team who's knowledgeable, um, how can they reach you? Yeah. So one of the easiest ways with all my clients to reach me is either by phone or text. I work with all my clients. We're 100% remote. So we work with clients from 
California, all the way to Florida, to Maine, Oregon, all across the United States. Um, the best number to reach me at is 805-364-0908. Like Jackie said, it'll be in the show notes. Um, just if you ever want to talk about something, give me a call, give me a text. If you have a situation going on that you need to, to, to go over, um, that's one of the easiest ways to reach me. You can always reach me by email, which will also be in uh, the show notes. Um, and we have our website as thompsontaxgroup.com. Yep. So today um, we're going to be talking about a lot of different topics. We're going to be talking about some tax things that you need to know about, some legislation that is coming up that might or might not be passed, but again, you need to be aware of. Uh, we're going to talk about rug pulls. We're going to talk about, you know, um, what do you do if your coins get hacked? And we're going to talk a little bit about wills and estate planning from the overview perspective. Again, um, every state is different. Um, and, you know, even on the federal side, there's a lot of different definitions going on. So, Joshua, what do you want us to dive into first? Yeah, you know, I would love to dive into the, the bill that they're working on right now. It really just got completed and they're, they're trying to turn into an act, passing it through Congress um, that two senators actually just worked on. And it's a bill that goes into a lot of details of, of uh, basically the information we've been needing as crypto investors or crypto enthusiasts. And it gives us what we need, especially when it comes down to tax time. So I would love to just dive into there, talk about a few of the sections they have going yeah. on, what it means to us and, and kind of uh, go from there. But, okay. What do you want to talk about first? Yeah. So in the bill, there's a number of sections. Really, this bill um, by the two senators are to want to start by really defining cryptocurrency, defining NFTs, and, and defining it not just crypto side of things, but also how it relates on the tax side of things. So we know how to to um to properly classify them at the end of the day and how they should be taxed. Because really with cryptocurrency. The high risk hasn't given us enough guidance on how really staking is taxed, how um, other items should be handled, NFTs. We can only assume as it relates to previous things in the past, um, but, but really we don't know 100% sure. And I think really the IRS is kind of going the safe side of not classifying it yet, and they've been missing deadlines on giving us this information. Actually, in this bill, one of the sections well, I'll get into uh, briefly, it just talks about how if this is passed, it puts a strict guideline on the IRS on, listen, by this date and time, you need to give us this information so that way America knows how to properly classify their crypto staking, their NFTs, how it's going to be taxed. Is it ARC? Is it um, self-employment income? Is it going to be regular ordinary income tax? There's a lot going on there that we just don't know too much about. Okay, so I see in um, the blog that you wrote, which also will be in the, um, the notes below, there are different sections, section 201, 204, 205. Um, do you want to talk about the specific things or um, is there something that jumps out um, that is uh, we need to highlight? Yeah, definitely. So I'll, I'll kind of jump into section 201. Um, so right now in section 201 of this uh, bill that they want to get passed, talks about basically a de minimis exclusion. Um, at the current moment, we all know if we have crypto, um, we buy it at one price and sell it a little bit higher at another price, we have to pay taxes on that gain, right? So with this new de minimis exclusion, you don't have to pay any taxes on a gain of up to $200. Meaning if you buy crypto, say you got lucky and bought Bitcoin at $1 and all of a sudden today it's $199 or $200. Um, you don't have to pay taxes on that spread if you utilize it and spend it on an item or service or, or something like that. Um, they're doing that to help bring the utilization of cryptocurrency more mainstream so people don't feel like it's a burden to actually utilize cryptocurrency because they're always being taxed on it because it goes up in value. So they want to implement this de minimis exclusion. So I really want to talk about that idea. So on the one side, you have a coin that has a value that appreciates. On the other side, you have the coin, the same coin that can be used for the purchase of goods or services. And what you just shared to me is for me an aha moment in my thinking process from the perspective that if I decide to go ahead and use my Bitcoin for the purchase of, let's say, a pizza, um, then 
the challenge I have is I have to now think, okay, I've just spent $10 on the pizza, but my Bitcoin has increased, but now I still have to think about the taxes that I have now um, incurred because of the appreciation. So I really like the idea that they are looking at a, a cap. So that way, if the appreciation is not that high, um, or loss, you know, either way, then you don't have to think about that. But my only concern is these coins fluctuate on a daily month, daily basis, not yeah. monthly, daily basis. So um, given that 200 to me seems really low because of the fact that are, are they looking at, at what point are they looking at that appreciation? Are they, are they looking at it? Um, what day is it the is it like the last day of the year which is when you have to like in some of the tax things if you have inventory you look at the last day of the year to see what is your inventory then and that's what you then um uh share with the irs i that there's that big question to me um and i don't know if they've answered that question because it's not like it doesn't go up and down yeah and that's one of the biggest things too, you know, that's one of the ones we want to get answered. What day would they want us to value it? Because the value of it January 1st could be completely different from January 30th or even yeah. the very next day. If, if we went off of um, how other items are treated, kind of like stock, we'll assume, because we can only assume at this point, they would treat it as on the day you purchased it and then is the, your purchase price and your basis. And then on the day you use it as a transaction or sold it, in this case, or bought a service, that would be the date you would value it in that case. So really it would be the two difference between those two dates. But once again, we don't 100% know uh, how they would want us to do it. And that's another thing that we're just kind of, we're waiting for that information. Yeah. So, I mean, again, for anyone who's listening, this is really important. Everyone needs to communicate with their congressperson or senators. So that way they understand that these are questions that you have if you're, you know, dabbling in the cryptocurrency space, because if you keep quiet, they don't know that this is a question or concern that you have. Um, because they're being, some of them are, you know, using and a part of the blockchain. Some of them are new and they're learning. Um, what's the next thing that in this area, I see uh, decentralized autonomous organizations, DAOs, section 204. What's going on with DAOs? Um, for those that don't know what a DAO is, it sort of is like um, a co-op. It's like a club, an organization that has like-minded individuals, but What's going on tax-wise with that? Yeah, so tax-wise, as far as individuals, nothing really changed yet. They want to get more so on the DAO itself because really individuals, yes, they can own part of the DAO, um, but as far as the DAO itself, we're talking millions and millions of dollars invested in it. So they really want to focus their attention on the DAO. Um, right now, DAOs are really organizations that use what we call smart contracts. Um, and in you as a part owner of the DAO, if you own some of that coin and you stake it um, with them, then you can vote on a change that is about to occur. Uh, and, and that's, and based on that vote is how, or your vote is only as strong as how much of that coin you own. And then you can influence on what that DAO does next with those funds. Um, really what they want to do with this bill, they want to determine how these organizations, the DAOs, are going to be treated. They want to treat them as business entities, make them pay taxes on any gains that they have and, and uh, anything else they, they have going on. But at the same time, it's hard to determine because you have this DAO, that's a business, paying taxes up here, but I'm a part owner of that DAO. How do I get my, um, how am I going to get benefit if this DAO has a loss? You know, how am I going to get benefit to show that if this DAO has a gain? Are they going to issue me a K-1 at the end of the year, which is the IRS tax form for certain businesses? Um, are they going to give me dividends? Am I supposed to just, you know, assume what my gain is going to be? So they want to start by determining how a DAO will be classified. And then I think that will just be the spearhead into getting more and deeper and deeper into DAOs. If, the, if DAOs remain a big um, thing in the crypto space, I know they, they blew up and, I would say between September to January, and then they kind of started falling off a little bit. 
but we'll see what they do. So what's the next thing that you would like to um, share um, on your list of sections? Yeah, so then, then there's section 205. Uh, section 205 kind of talks about when you lend virtual currency. Right now, common sense set tells us if we lend virtual currency or cryptocurrency, it's going to be interest income. But really, the IRS hasn't given us guidance on that. Section 205 would give us more guidance on that. Um, technically, if you lend um, money out, like just saying, just talk, you know, typical fiat currency, your dollars, your, your euro, um, you're going to be taxed on that the gain is going to be interest income. Now, if it's an actual business and you consider it a business, then you get taxed at self-employment tax. And that's where it's kind of like, well, like, okay, do we consider this as business income if we're um, lending it and then have it taxed as self-employment and ordinary income? Or do we only have it as interest income taxed as ordinary income tax rate? Um, so then the bill wants to give more guidance on that aspect of it. So uh, talking about taxes, uh, section 206 um, that you talked about, um, it uh, talks about how cryptocurrency would be taxed in the past. What does that mean? Say that one more time. Oh, um, if you're looking at your blog and you're looking at section 206, you mm -hmm. talk about uh, an additional way that cryptocurrency might be taxed. Did you, did you already cover that or was that, um, is there something else different going on? Yeah, I mean, that's that's so far, I guess, kind of along the lines of what I was saying is depending on if you're just doing this as a hobby or a full time business, then you could be determined if you have to just pay capital gains or do you have to pay ordinary income tax or do you have to pay self-employment taxes? Right. And a lot of people don't know where they fall in the category. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and IRS really hasn't given much guidance. Um, Section 206 actually of the bill will force the IRS to give more guidance by a specific date. So that way we know what we're doing and when, because last thing we want to do is today, consider we have staking income of a million dollars, which I just talked to someone that does a million dollars. And then they end up um, classifying that as ordinary income because they consider it interest income. And then IRS comes back three years later saying, no, 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 it's self-employment tax. And now you have to pay penalties and interest for the past three years. And that's tough. But there is a code section in, in the um, Internal Revenue Manual basically saying, or Internal Revenue Code basically saying that the IRS can do that. They can retroactively change the tax law and force people to comply. But my question is, if you were following the rules of the taxes at the time when you filed your tax return, how is it that you are now being penalized based upon a new ruling retroactively? Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, so the way you end up getting penalized is if the IRS comes out, if they don't actually have code section that's out and says, this is exactly how we're going to tax this, uh, if they don't have that actually out, they have the ability to go to the American people and say, listen, you know, we're, we're thinking about changing this. We don't really know how we want to tax this yet, but just stand by and, and wait to find out. And years can go by. And once like two, three years go by and the IRS finally comes around and says, okay, we've determined your interest income for staking or your staking income is now going to be taxed as self-employment. They could retroactively go back and say it started back in 2018. So now you need to go back and amend your tax returns. Um, it's funny because I was actually taking it and taking a research course, tax research course, and, and they have the full ability to do something like that if they, if they necessarily wanted to. Um, and right now they can because there's not really any tax code that's out that says otherwise. So um, is there no omnibusman or support person for those of us who are following the rules? I mean, it sounds like there's, um, it's the big brother kind of hammering, putting a hammer down when in fact we actually um, have um, already, uh, um, you know, followed the rules. Right. So really the IRS, and, the IRS really hasn't put it in the code. Um, they've only issued like notices, uh, internal revenue or internal, um, I think it's, man, I'm, just, I'm drawing a blank, but basically something, something IRS notices that they've issued kind of giving a little bit of guidance. Mm -hmm. But because it's not actually in the code, 
they have the ability to retroactively go back and say, we're going to tax it a little bit different now that we have more, more information. Um, you know, I'm sure there's lobbyists that are campaigning and fighting for crypto investors. I'm not sure of any right now, but they would be the ones saying like, hey, listen, if anything does change, don't make it retroactive, make it moving forward only. And that's what I'm going to say for everyone, again, who's listening, when you write your congressman or senator, this is another important part. Uh, point to say, because again, if we're doing things in good faith and we are trying to be you know, transparent about everything that we're doing, don't penalize us for something that um, didn't exist in the past. Um, because again, we can't plan that way. Um, so let's see, there is, uh, you talked about staking, you talked about um, you know, the digital currencies, oh, retirement accounts. Yeah. That's that's something which we didn't cover. A lot of people are looking at Bitcoin IRAs and things like that. Yeah. Um, what's new in that area? Yeah, so I'll touch on that. I, I want to just touch on what you said real quick about your contacting your congressman or woman. So believe it or not, they're actually really good about getting back to you. Um, I know, so I'm, I was in the military. I had an issue with the VA when I first got out. I wrote my congresswoman in California um, when I was living there at the time. and I would say a week later, I got a message back from our office. Two weeks later, the whole issue was cleared up. And yeah. it took me a few months to get there. So they're really good actually getting back to you and listening to you what you say. Um, but to kind of move forward, so into the retirement accounts, that became a big thing really, I would say last year, putting crypto in retirement accounts. Um, it, crypto at the moment is looked at as a speculative investment, right. basically meaning, you know, you don't know if it's going to go up, it's going to go down, it's kind of high risk, high reward. And really, the Department of Justice um, doesn't like to see that in a retirement account, any speculative investing. So they're actually, the Department of Justice is actually investigating this and, and kind of determining, should it be allowed in retirement accounts? Uh, and so this section will kind of give us more information if this is something that we can do moving forward because it's speculative. We don't want to lose the tax benefits of a 401k or a Roth IRA account if we've invested in cryptocurrency in the past. So um, there's a lot going on for everyone who's listening. And it really is important that, um, you know, if you have specific questions to send those questions to your Congress people, um, not just at the federal level, at the state level too. You know, there's a lot that goes on um, at the state that determine and impact um, blockchain businesses, individuals. So um, there are associations that I belong to that, um, you know, exist um, throughout the country. So it's really important for everyone to continue your education and your participation um, because otherwise um, there'll be rules and laws that um, are going to be more restrictive. And I'm all about consumer protection, but I think it's important for the freedom of what the blockchain was created for, um, which is many things, um, for us to be able to develop it and not be to cons be constrained by laws that were written in the 1930s and the 1934. I'm talking about the SEC Act, uh, because that was way before the internet. That was way before you know cryptocurrency. So I you know have my own views about whether digital currencies are securities. But again, again, there needs to be consistent definitions. So. Um, Let's see, what topic do you want to talk about next? Um, we talked about, or are there any other tax um, things that people need to know about? Um, so the last one would be um, of the bill, section 208, is um, back in 2014, believe it long, that long ago, IRS came out saying, hey, if you have uh, mining awards uh, or staking awards, they're taxed at the time that you basically are, are um Basically, you have them. You can access them. Even if you reinvest it, your tax as soon as you get it, kind of like dividends uh, in, in that case. And really, Section 208 will change that. And instead of being taxed as soon as you get it, it'll be taxed once you pull it out. So that way, you're not paying tax on something that you don't actually physically have yet. So that's something that they want to adjust to to make it a little bit easier on people that are staking or mining uh, at the end of the day so, so they don't have to keep continuing to sell their their what they're mining and staking to pay the taxes i think that would be i think that's very realistic considering that you are if you don't have full ease of access to it to be able to use it 
then um, or 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 if you're not using it for 12 months, you know, I think that really at the point you actually use it, that's when you should get taxed on it. But again, I'm glad that they're looking at these various things. Um, so, you know, you had talked about, um, I had talked about, you know, rug pulls. I had talked about also organization of information. From the accounting perspective, um, what do you find that people need to be thinking about in terms of organizing their information throughout the year so that when they come to someone like yourself, they're not overwhelmed with um, all the information they need to provide to you. Um, so that way you can do the best job for them and get them the, you know, the information they need as to what their tax bite might need. Yeah, you know, I would say one of the biggest thing is exactly what you were saying earlier, Jackie, is, you know, constantly look at your wallet, see how it's doing. You know, remember, if you're working on multiple exchanges, what exchanges you're working on, have that trust. So that trust would also help you remember where your funds are as well when it comes to tax time, what, where everything is. Uh, I always highly recommend an individual to work with either coin tracker, coin tracking, and it's a third one as well. It helps keep track of your wallets for- Coin Coinly? Well, yeah, exactly, Coinly. Mm -hmm. uh, to help keep track of your transactions, what's going on, and classify them every time you have a transaction. You know, As long as you're not doing 20,000 transactions, I know it can be a little overwhelming, but every time you have a transaction, try at the end of each day to go in there and properly classify this was staking income. This was just a, trans, a transfer. This is actually uh, personal funds coming into the account. So it's not taxable. That will make a huge difference when to, unless if you instead wait to the end of the year and try and classify something you had back in March. Um, it, it makes it so much harder. I totally agree with you because when I'm looking at um, the wallets that I have and I'm trying to look up, not every wallet has the same drop down reports. Some wallets have reports that have, I've opened up a lot of wallets for those that are listening, not necessarily to put any crypto into, but to also to learn more about what those wallets are. And so some of those wallets will have tax reports that you can pull easily. Some of them don't. And so then you have to either do a screenshot or you know print things out so you can create, if you wanna have a print folder so that, you know again, you have to decide, are you going to be doing an electronic folder? And like you said, it's if you are, even if you simply move your US dollars to an account to buy a coin that you're going to hold, you, you and there is a obviously a history of transactions. Um, so you can see wh where everything came from. But if you then move something from that account to another account, you have to document what you're doing. It's no different than if you have two US bank accounts and you're, you have deposits in one account, you need to know, okay, is that income? Is that just a friend giving you money? You know, um, so, you, so you don't classify it as income because again, again, friends giving money might be income, but I'm just saying, let's say, you know, it's for reimbursement of something that you bought them. So um, it's organization of information is critical. And it, as we all know, it takes time. So it's a lot easier to do a little bit, you know, every month than to try to do it at the end of the year. Um, so when you um, when you are uh, onboarding a client, what kind of information do you need? Yeah, so usually when onboarding a client, we usually like to look at their past year's tax return, figure out what's going on, their situation, where we can help at. Um, and, and then from there, if we're working with crypto, we usually ask them to give us accountant access to their crypto wallet, uh, well, not wallet, more so transactions in one of the three platforms we looked at. So that way we can make sure everything's properly classified if that's the case, uh, make sure uh, you what you're expecting as far as gains and taxes, what we're actually showing. Because for a number of times we work with clients where what they're expecting was largely different from what the platform's showing because everything wasn't properly classified. You know, so after sitting down, working with them, going through it, instead of going every month or every week or every day, like they should have been doing, we did it all at the end of the year. It's a little bit more of a load and, and difficult to do. And sometimes, you know, unfortunately, some things get forgotten because it was back in March for the individual. But I would say that's the biggest thing when working with someone is using utilizing one of the three platforms, um, having the pastor's tax return. And honestly, with that, I would say about 70% of the battle is already is already fought in that, fought in that case. 
Yeah. So, um, you know, what I'm always amazed at is, you know, you talked about ex expectations of return. Well, you know, the market goes up and down. And so if the market goes down, um, what about losses? How um, are individuals or businesses able to take those losses? Any guidance? Again, I should not say guidance because this is not, um, you know, we're not giving any advice here. But what's an overview for people to be thinking about? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Appreciate you specifying. So uh, when it comes down to it, you're having losses on the individual side of things. Losses in crypto is great because you don't have that that um, limitation, basically. You don't have the $3,000 limitations like stocks when you have losses that you, you uh, have. Um, as far as when you have theft or loss um, with cryptocurrency that's personal cryptocurrency, you can't write that off. You don't have a place to write it off. You could, prior to the Tax Cut and Jobs Act that passed for, in the change of 2018, you're able to write it off, but now you're not able to until tax year 2026. Uh, if, unless they change it again, you can start writing that off. Now, if you're a business, that starts changing things. But a business in certain circumstances or cases, and we can sit down and talk about this again, cer certain times you can actually write off those stolen crypto assets. And that's when kind of tying in what we were talking about earlier, it can be beneficial to consider yourself a business instead of a uh, um, you know, a hobby or just an individual that's doing it. So it's only tax or ordinary income. Sometimes there's benefits. That's just one of them. There's many more. So uh, for everyone who's been listening, and you might have been following me um, because I do many, many things, um, and I add different tools to my toolbox just because of the consulting that I do. Um, so one of the areas that I recently became certified in is as a certified cryptocurrency investigator. And I use the platform called Clue, which is from the, um, the Blockchain Intelligent Group. And um, I'm really excited to be able to uh, help people. I'm not excited if you happen to get rug pulled or things you know happen like that. But if you have had a situation like that, definitely reach out to me, um, you know, through Joshua or even separately. And that way I can talk to you about um, what that type of consulting would be in order for uh, you to get support to track, you know, where the funds are and to see if there's a way to retrieve them. So everything is traceable on the blockchain. It's just a question of timing as to how and when um, you're able to then um, get them back. Uh, so, um, I know that we have had a, a, a major list of topics. What else did we maybe miss during our overview? Because it's the end of the year and people need to be thinking about things right now. Yeah, um, I would say now's the best time than ever to start with some tax planning, to figure out what's going on with your situation, to even do a tax projection to kind of figure yeah. out, hey, listen, at this, where we're at right now, and we project out what we're going to be, a, and by the end of the year, what are we going to be owing tax-wise? You'd be amazed on how much a situation could change in six months, or, or um, for sometimes you may have a big tax debt, or do, you know, liability at the end of the year. You want to make sure if we can adjust that before the six months or the remainder of the year is over, so that way you don't have any penalties on top of that um, large liability. So I would say that's the biggest thing right now. Do some tax planning, do a tax projection, sit down with your tax advisor, whoever you're working with, and just kind of figure out what's going on. Educate yourself on anything that's changed recently. Feel free to check out our blog. We usually post uh, reminders that's going out for, for clients, um, what's going on, uh, changes in the tax law, and don't forget to do X, Y, Z. So the other thing that I was going to say is just like sometimes you might have more than one attorney, sometimes you might need more than one um, financial planner or accountant that has the knowledge of this niche. So, you know, if you find that your uh, traditional advisors are not comfortable in this area, um, you know, definitely reach out to Joshua and myself. Um, I know that I am open to giving um um, a short uh, 15 minute complimentary consultation just to talk to you about both the will planning, um, state planning and the uh, cryptocurrency investigation to see if um, I might be the proper fit for you and what your needs are. 
Um, but again, you these are all part of your professional team, whether you're an individual or a business. Um, so Joshua, any other last minute thoughts that you want to share before we sign off? I know we're going to be doing more than one episode because this is really the kickoff to the tax season planning. And so again, it's getting to be the last quarter. It's sort of like in a football game. You have to, you know, think about, okay, how are you going to pull in that win? <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> Perfect analogy. Um, but no, I think that's, that's pretty much everything. I would just, last thing I'll leave you guys with is don't wait until December 31st, December 1st, April 15th to start thinking about taxes. Taxes happen every day of the year throughout the entire year. You got to think about it like that. And at any moment, you can make an adjustment that can help you out either in the good or in the bad if you're not educated. Yeah. And within the crypto space, um, the digital asset space, because if you own NFTs, that's a whole nother thing that needs to be considered too. Um, it, this, this is a little bit more complicated than a traditional business only because it's new. And um, so it doesn't mean that it, that's a negative. It just means you have to kind of set up your system. So that way it can be time efficient and you can enjoy why it is that you decided to get involved with it. So, um, so with that being said, remember Joshua's contacts will be in the blog below along with mine. And I definitely encourage everyone to reach out to us. Um, we're here to support and serve. Um, and if you have questions that we didn't answer, definitely message us so that way we can do the next episode, we can do a follow-up because again, in a short time, it's a, not a deep dive. But be kind to yourself, be kind to um, others. Remember, we're all part of one world and we're also interconnected, and especially as this blockchain has shown. So again, everyone have a great day, like and subscribe, and we'll talk soon. Thank you, bye.